Retirement is when you stop living at work and start working at living. And that is the thought for today. Welcome to 7 Good Minutes. I'm Clyde Lee Dennis. Thanks for joining me for what I believe will be seven of the most enriching minutes of your day. In today's episode of 7 Good Minutes, we have a TEDx talk that will transform your mind to a new way of thinking about retirement. Enjoy. A decade ago, I was the definition of time poor. I was on the fast track to a VP role in a major mining company, and I thought my work was so important that I could not afford to take even a single day off. So I didn't. For 18 months, I was working my butt off. That all came to a halt when I fell ill. And not just a little bit ill, I was bedridden for five weeks. And if you've ever had an experience of being ill for longer than you thought of, you know, like a common cold you think is going to be one week, drags into two, drags into three. Some of the feelings I experienced were things like helplessness, like I had no control over my body, like I could do nothing to get myself out of bed, like all that motivation and get up and go that had got me so far in my career was going to be no use to me. I also felt hopeless. Like that bed was going to be my future. I was just going to be surrounded by tissues from crying my eyes out for the rest of my life. And it got so bad that in week four, I stuffed myself full of every drug they'd given me and got myself on a plane and flew 4,000 kilometres home to my mummy so she could look after me. It turns out that it was a virus that sent me to bed. But it was my poor health choices and my lack of energy reserves that kept me there. As a result of that sickness, I've lost half of the hearing in my right ear and I now have ground, uh, gold crowns, which I call my mouth bling, on my rear molars because I split my teeth in two, grinding them in my sleep from the stress. Having your health irreversibly damaged when you're 26 years old is no fun at all, but it was the wake-up call that I needed. I decided to take leave without pay and went travelling to South America with my partner. And having now seen it, I can say there's nothing quite like a man-made marvel such as Machu Picchu to put the insignificance of your work into perspective. (laughs) Three months later, I had seen six countries and my eyes had been opened to a world beyond work and I thought about why I had made work such a big part of my life when there seemed so much more to be discovered. Alas, all good things must come to an end. I flew home and back to work. When I got back to work, it was a bit of a shock, but I soon fell into my old routine. Until, three months later, my little sister Megan committed suicide. She was 24 years old, and I thought she had everything to live for. Megan's death brought that idle pondering into sharp focus. I became consumed with questions about why we work ourselves to death. Why we spend so much of our time at work not enjoying it and sacrificing so much. My life to that point was an example like a textbook. I had allowed myself to be worked to the point of physical and mental collapse for a company that would have replaced me within a week if I'd gone under a bus. It seemed like a waste of my time. And like most people in personal crisis, I went looking for help. And I started in the self-help section of a bookstore, back when you used to like, actually go into a bookstore. And that's when I came across Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. And it was a revelation, particularly on the topic of time. It's no surprise that time poor is the catch cry of our era, because it's our most precious, non-renewable resource. We lament the lack of hours in the day to do all that we could want to do, never mind that you and I have the same 24 hours a day as Beyonce or Barack Obama. It just never feels like we have enough time. And that's over the micro scale of a single day. Over the macro scale of our lifetimes, we spend 40 plus of our best years grinding away, sometimes our teeth, at work. And then, finally, we reach the official retirement age and we get to stop. 
we finally are time rich instead of time poor. We can do whatever we want with our time. We could travel. We could volunteer. We could spend time with our families. Only now we're old. What we wouldn't give at that point to have some of that time-rich feeling when we were young. The thing is, we made end-of-life retirement up. It's not compulsory. Retirement was invented in the 1880s in Prussia in response to socialists demanding more for the public. And at the time, they set the retirement age at 70 years old. And that was the approximate lifespan in that era. So not everybody got to retire. They didn't actually get to have what we get now. And when they did retire, they probably only got a few years. Retirement became widespread in the work-scarce times following the Great Depression, when it was seen as a way to get older members of the workforce out of the way so that younger people could come through because they needed that money to raise their families. Times have changed, lifespans have increased, and yet end-of-life retirement remains. And the retirement age is pretty comparable, around the mid-60s for most developed nations. So now, instead of having a handful of years for a handful of people to look forward to, most of us are looking at two decades of that time-rich feeling, when we're old. In the book, Ferris asked the question, what if we could take some of that end-of-life retirement and bring it forward into our youth in small chunks so we could have that time-rich feeling when we're young and healthy? He called these small periods of respite mini retirements. That does it for today's episode of 7 Good Minutes. Please take a moment to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. If you have questions, you can ask those by going to 7goodminutes.com slash askclyde or get me on Twitter at Clyde Lee Dennis. Until next time, let's be civil to one another out there. Thanks for listening.